Well, good morning, Mercy Church. Hey, thank you so much for welcoming me into your living room. Thank you for having everything cleaned up after Christmas. Well, some of you. My name is Brett, and I'm one of the pastors at Mercy, and I have the joy of preaching the word to you this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and take them out. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. You can run and grab it. I'm not going to be able to see you, so you can go and do that now. But 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 is where we're going to be today. And y'all, I am really excited about preaching this word. I think it fits well with the time of the year. Today is the last day of 2023. And uh, I got to say, y'all, I I find myself being unsurprised at the end of this year because I always come into the new year thinking this next year is going to be so much better than last year. Like I have all of my New Year's resolutions that I intend to crush and I get all excited. And then what ends up happening is I crush about 30% of them and then I get crushed by the other 70% of them. I find myself believing that things around the world are just going to magically get better and that the world's just going to be a happier place. And then inevitably at the end of the year, it's, it's just not. I mean, just a few years ago in 2019, we thought for sure that 2020 was going to be the year where we had 2020 vision. We were going to be able to see the world more clearly. And then COVID happened. And the only thing we were seeing clearly was the four walls of our living room. And then 2021 came. We thought surely this year couldn't be any worse than last. For many of us, it was. Same thing with 2022. And now at the end of 2023, I can't help but feel like the trend has only continued. On a macro level, there have been some hard things that have happened in our world. Think about uh, the natural disasters like the earthquake that happened in Turkey in February. I think about the wildfires that happened in Hawaii. Um, Think about the wars happening in Israel and Ukraine. We've lost some people who were really important to us. We lost Queen Elizabeth. We lost Chandler from Friends. We even lost Jimmy Buffett this last year. That one hit hard with my father-in-law. But also on a micro level, there have been some things that have been really hard in our own personal lives. Maybe this past year you struggled with sin. Maybe it was old sin that you thought by now it would be gone and it reared its ugly head again. Maybe it was new sin that seemed to crop up out of nowhere. Maybe there was sickness in your family or you lost a loved one. Maybe you struggled with depression. And maybe you had an awesome year and this year was like really good for you. But I think In some way, shape, or form, all of us can agree, like, it's been a hard year. And I think the question we're all wondering as we come into 2024 is this, will things get better this next year? And y'all, while I don't have the answer to that question, I do believe that our text today gives us a glimpse into how even amid brokenness and darkness, there's something that you and I can personally do to take steps towards making 2024 a better year. And I believe that what we're going to read and talk about today needs to be right at the top of your resolution list for this year. Because y'all, saving money and paying off debt is a great thing, but it doesn't have the power to give someone hope amid tragedy. Going to the gym three times a week and eating clean is a good thing. And if you do it, you're going to feel great, and you should do it but it doesn't have the power to shine a light on the deepest, darkest places of someone's soul when they're hurting. But I believe that God has given something, given us something that will. And here's what it is. This is the main point that I want to take, that I want you to take home this morning. It's that God's call for you is to make proclaiming his word your top goal in 2024. God's call for you is to make proclaiming his word your top goal for 2024. Y'all, I believe that if we cling to this word this year, it will change everything about the way we view this next year. I believe it will bring joy to your souls. I believe that God will use it to bring hope to our city and that he'll save people. I believe that it may be the very thing that makes 2024 better than 2023. So that's where we're going. You all ready? All right, let's do it. 2 Timothy 4 verses 1 through 5. Here's what the text says. I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus, who is going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, 
but according to their own desires, will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, exercise self-control in everything, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This is the word of the Lord. A little background on our text, the person writing these words is the Apostle Paul. If you're new to the Bible, Paul was one of the most influential Christians of all time, and his story is pretty crazy. See, Paul was a murderer who God saved, and then God ended up using to write most of the New Testament, and he was one of the fathers of the early church. And one of the themes in Paul's ministry was that he was persecuted severely for his faith. If you flip through the book of Acts and read about Paul, you'll see that there were times where he was kidnapped because of his faith, where he was beaten, where he was threatened, where he was accused during lawsuits. He was interrogated. He was ridiculed. He was shipwrecked. This man was even bitten by a snake. Like, he went through it. And as he's writing the text that we're looking at today, he's writing from a dark and cold prison cell. Because of his faith, Paul had been arrested and the end of his life was near, and he knew it. Paul was living in a dark time, and he was smack dab in the middle of suffering that you and I couldn't even imagine. And he's writing to his disciple Timothy. Timothy was a leader in the church who had followed closely in the footsteps of Paul. He was one of Paul's closest friends. And so Paul's giving this farewell address to Timothy. He knows that he'll likely never see him again, and he's got one last thing that he wants to say to his beloved friend, and his charge was simple. Timothy, proclaim the word of God. Mercy Church, I believe this charge is for you as well. You see, Paul's whole goal in life after being saved was to proclaim the word of God to others and then to raise up others to do the same so that they would go and raise up others to do the same. This is discipleship, and it's the very means that God uses in our world to spread his gospel. It's the reason that you and I have the gospel today. And so as you hear Paul's final charge to Timothy, you should hear these same words as Paul's final charge to you. Mercy Church, proclaim the word of God. Make it your top goal in 2024. But Paul doesn't just leave us with that. In his charge to Timothy, he gives some specific instructions about what this is going to look like. If he's going to faithfully proclaim God's word, then then he's also going to have to do these things, and you are too. So let's talk about what those things are. The first thing that he writes is that in order to proclaim the word of God faithfully, you must proclaim the word of God fearfully. In verse 1, he writes, I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus who's going to judge the living and the dead, and because of the appearing of his kingdom. There's this reality that you and I live in every single day as Christians, and it's that we live before the very presence of God. God is alive and active. He rose from the grave, and he rules and reigns in the heavens. And for those in Christ, he's even living within us through his Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that he sees us when we're sleeping. He knows when we're awake. And yes, he knows if we've been bad or good. And the Bible tells us that we've all been bad, but that Jesus died in our place. Amen? Amen. Y'all, the presence of God is something that we often talk about in Christian circles, but I feel like we generally talk about it in ways that instill bravery in one another, right? So you have a scary moment, like you're in your house, getting ready for bed, you cut off the lights, all of a sudden you hear a noise. And you go to Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. We we have this bravery that comes from the presence of God, even when that's not actually all that scary. And y'all, the presence of God absolutely should give us tremendous courage. It should remind us that we can go out and do brave things because God, the creator of heavens and the earth, is going with us. But I believe that there's something else that the presence of the Lord should do for us. It should cause us to tremble. Think of Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus 33. In this text, he asked to see the glory of the Lord, and God responds to him, you cannot see my face, for humans cannot see me and live. And what ends up happening in that story is the Lord allows 
uh, Moses to see his back for 40 days and 40 nights. And when Moses comes down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments to bring them to Israel, his face was glowing and the people were terrified of him. This was the effect of being in the presence of the Lord. The author of Hebrews writes of Moses seeing the presence of the Lord and says, the appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Mercy, if you're being honest, is this your response to knowing that you live in the presence of God? Does it cause you to have a holy fear that leads you to humility and obedience to him? Or is it only a weapon for you to utilize to overcome scary circumstances? The text tells us that the one who created us, the one who gave his life up for us on the cross, the one who's going to come back again and judge the living and the dead, and is going to usher in a new kingdom, he's with us right now. We're living in the presence of God, and his command for us is to obey him and to proclaim his word. Y'all, this should shape everything about how we live our lives. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Friends, our text today gives a word to the wise. If we're going to faithfully obey the command from God to proclaim his word, then we must proclaim his word fearfully, knowing that we live in his presence. We must remember that the God who has commissioned us to go therefore and make disciples is also the same God who says, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The next thing that we see from our text is that in order to proclaim the word of God faithfully, you must proclaim the word of God fully. In order to proclaim the word of God faithfully, you must proclaim the word of God fully. Paul continues in the text saying, in light of the presence of God, Verse two, preach the word. Preach the word. It's such a simple statement, yet it has huge implications. This word preach simply means to proclaim or to herald. And when Paul writes preach the word, he meant to proclaim all of God's scripture. So in our context today, that's Paul saying to Timothy, Timothy, go and preach the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And just a few verses before our text today, Paul spells out exactly why this is his final charge to Timothy. You may be familiar with this passage, but 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul knew that if there was going to be a gospel awakening if disciples were going to be made, if the church was going to continue to be built up and made complete for the work that God had called them to, then they would have to be fed God's breathed out word. And they'd have to be fed a full diet of his word. It's the very life-giving nourishment that every single human being needs. Jesus himself says as he's being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Church, this should help you see why we should proclaim his word. People need it to live. But it should also help you see that if we're going to proclaim his word faithfully, then we have to proclaim his word fully. We can't just piecemeal God's word and say, oh, I like these parts, but I don't like that part, so I'm going to throw it out. No, there's no room for red letter Christians in what Paul is saying here. He's saying we need every bit of it. Now, I want to say before you start freaking out and thinking that you need to memorize Leviticus so that you can share a passage at your next family gathering, I want to give you a caveat that's hopefully helpful to you. Remember that Paul is writing to Timothy, who was a preacher. Okay, most of you listening to this sermon are not preachers. And so you're proclaiming the word to others is going to look a little bit different than it did for our boy Timothy. Rather than preaching a crowd who is coming ready to learn about the word of God from you, the people that God has placed around you to proclaim the word to are your friends, your roommates, your coworkers, your family members. And my guess is that you're most likely not going to be exegeting passages from the minor prophets or digging into the annals of Second Chronicles with them. And if you, if you do, and if, if you are, then that's amazing. Kudos to you, and I want to be discipled by you. That's awesome. But regardless, I do think there's an application for you here. A question that I want to ask you 
is are you striving to know God's word fully? Like, have you sat down and read the scriptures for yourself? Mercy Church, God's desire for you, not just for preachers, not just for those that work in the church, is that you would know his word fully from Genesis to Revelation. And he's even given you his spirit, if you're in Christ, to illuminate his word to you so that you can understand it and that his desire for you is you would daily spend time reading it, meditating on it, and as a result, flourishing in your walk with him and then delightfully proclaiming his word to others. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. And so here at the start of the new year, y'all, I think this is a perfect time for you to come up with a game plan for how you're going to get to know God's word this year. Maybe that means taking some time this afternoon right after this sermon is over and doing some research on Bible reading plans and texting some friends or talking to your family about which one you're going to commit to doing and asking them to join in with you. If you've never done that before, that's okay. You can start small. Maybe your goal is to read one book of the Bible this year. You can start with, uh, my recommendation is the book of John. It's a story of the account of Jesus' life and ministry written from one of his followers, and it's amazing. So maybe that's your starting place, and maybe you're hearing this and you still feel like you have no clue what to do, and maybe your next step then is getting connected to a community group at Mercy where you can walk alongside, uh, alongside some people who know how to do it and would love to show you how to do it. I'm confident that there's someone at our church who would love to show you what it looks like to meditate and read God's word. Y'all, what I believe will happen as you do this, as you dig into God's word, is that proclaiming it will simply be an overflow of your heart. As you meditate on these sweet realities of God's truth, you'll be having a conversation with somebody, they'll share something that they're struggling with, and all of a sudden, you start thinking, oh my gosh, this reminds me of the passage that I read this morning. I'm going to share it with them. And then you do it, and all of a sudden you bring hope to somebody, and you bring them life-giving nourishment that their soul needs. Y'all, this is what our world needs. Imagine what our city could look like in 2024 if every single person listening to this sermon would commit to this this year. Let's do this. So what is your plan to know God's word this year? If we're going to proclaim God's word faithfully, then we must proclaim God's word fully. And here's the final thing that we see in this passage. It's that in order to proclaim God's word faithfully, you must proclaim God's word consistently and courageously. This is how Paul finishes his charge to Timothy. He says, be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. Paul starts getting into some of the specifics about what proclaiming the word is going to look like for Timothy, and he says, be ready in season and out of season. That means proclaiming God's word consistently, even when you may not feel perfectly ready to do it. I recently read a story about a pastor who went on a mission trip to a leper colony in Nigeria. I was surprised as I was reading it to know that those even existed. And as he was serving there, his heart was breaking over the sickness and the hurting that he saw from the people. It was terrible. After they had visited for about an hour, One of their hosts said, all right, everyone, Pastor Tony is going to preach for us. Well, Pastor Tony had no idea that he was going to be preaching for them. And so he starts fumbling around. He has an internal freak out. He's like, what am I going to do? And then all of a sudden, he remembers these words from Paul, be ready in season and out of season. This is what he writes. He says, by God's grace, I just began preaching Romans 8 talking about suffering and glory and how we're all dying and need a savior. He said, I still have a picture of a lady who lost her fingers to leprosy standing behind me with both arms raised in the air to praise God. It was truly amazing. God's word is powerful to change the hearts of people in all places and at all times. Preach it consistently. Friends, I know for a fact that there's going to come a time this year when God is going to give you an opportunity to proclaim his word to somebody. And in that moment, you may feel unprepared. You may not feel ready or polished, but who cares? Think about this story and how this woman just needed to be told of the redeeming love of Christ. Do you think she would have been upset if Pastor Tony would have stuttered or maybe wouldn't have perfectly quoted Romans chapter 8? 
I don't think so. I think she just needed to hear about what Jesus had done for her. And this year, you're going to have that same kind of opportunity. And God's call is for you to be ready in season and out of season and to proclaim his word consistently. So will you do it? Will you do it? I believe that if you do, God's going to supply you with everything you need. And he'll use you in mighty ways. But y'all, it won't be easy. It's actually going to be hard and it's going to require courage. Paul writes that sometimes proclaiming God's word means correcting someone when they're off base. It may mean rebuking someone or sharply disapproving of what they're doing. It may mean encouraging someone for the hundredth time about the same thing and having to have great patience with them and teaching them as you do it. All of these things are hard and sometimes they're confrontational and they require courage. Even more, the text goes on to say, For there's going to come a time when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they'll multiply teachers for themselves, and they'll have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They'll turn away from hearing the truth and turn aside to myths. Paul warned Timothy that along with having to correct and rebuke and have patience, there was also coming a time where the people were just going to turn away. They would multiply teachers for themselves and turn to teachings that would satisfy their ears, their itching ears. Y'all, this is a prophetic word for us today. Our culture is growing increasingly opposed to the gospel and to the mission of the church. Aside from those who reject the gospel outright, and there's millions of people who do, there are teachers even within the church who preach messages contrary to the gospel. There are some who preach the prosperity gospel that if you just give enough to God, then he'll bless you with health and wealth. That is a lie. There are teachers who tell you that if you just live your truth and don't let anybody get in the way of that, then that's going to be how you lead your happiest life. That is a lie. Paul writes in Galatians 1.8, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. Y'all, there's one true gospel, and it's the gospel of Christ. We have chosen our ways against God's ways, and we deserve death. But God sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect and sinless life, to die on the cross for our sins, and to be raised back to life three days later. And it's by Christ's grace alone and through faith in Christ alone that you and I can be saved. There's absolutely nothing we can do to earn our way to God or to climb our way towards Him. Our response is to turn from our sin, to place our faith in Christ, and to receive this gift of eternal life that He freely gives. This is the one true gospel. And we have a call from the Lord to urgently make it known to a lost and dying world that's growing increasingly opposed to it. Y'all, if we're going to do that, then we're going to have to have courage like Paul. I mean, this man was at the end of his life in a prison cell, preaching the very things that got him there in the first place. But he did it because he was so convinced that the gospel was what the world needed. Do you believe that? Do you believe that too? Then Mercy Church, proclaim the word of God, no matter what. Do it consistently and courageously. Have those hard but good conversations. Be ready in season and out of season. This is what our world needs. And this will be the very thing that God uses to complete the ministry that he has given you. This is what Paul says to Timothy as he finishes our text. Verse 5, but as for you, in light of everything we talked about, as for you, exercise self-control in everything. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Mercy Church, this is your call in 2024. Proclaim the word of God. We live in a world that is in desperate need of hope. And y'all, we can pray, and I'm praying that this year would be a better year than last. But what I know to be true is that there's going to be moments that are hard for people, where they're going to struggle and challenges are going to arise. But the word of God and the message of the gospel has the power to bring the world hope even amid life's darkest circumstances. But how will they hear if we don't proclaim it to them? 
Romans 10, 14 and 15. It says, how then can they call on him in whom they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. So Mercy Church, would you make it your top resolution with me to proclaim the word of God in 2024? To proclaim it fearfully, to proclaim it fully, and to proclaim it consistently and courageously. Are you with me? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you have given us your word, that we can know about you, that you have saved us from the knowledge that comes from your word. God, you have shown us who you are, that Jesus, you have come for us, you died on the cross in our place, and you give us life in your name. I pray that if there's anybody hearing this and they don't believe in you, Jesus, or they haven't placed their faith in you, that they would know that you are calling them today to come, place your faith in Christ, and be saved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I pray, Lord, that people would place their faith in you today. And I pray for the church, those who are listening, who are in Christ and who love you, that together we would unite and we would say we are going to make proclaiming God's word our top goal for 2024. May it be so. Would we see a gospel awakening happen in the city of Charlotte that's carried to the ends of the earth? 